Hello, my name is Randy Trumbauer. I am assistant professor at Harvard Medical School's Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. I am the director of the Inspire Lab and of the Spinal Cord Injury Division at Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. I begin this presentation by first thanking Dr. Teresa Cruz and colleagues at the National Institutes of Health, National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, providing me an opportunity a special opportunity to speak with you today. What I would like to start with is a bit about my background and the 20 years, more than 20 years actually, dedicated toward clinical, scientific, and caregiving of individuals with spinal cord injury. And the work, much of the work that I've been doing has been dedicated to improving the quality of life of individuals with spinal cord injury. Indeed, there is no cure for spinal cord injury, and there remains an overwhelming frustration for the limited long-term functional benefits of many clinical treatments. This is due in part to our limited understanding of treatment targets and dosing. So today I will share with you my research on a fairly provocative treatment that attempts to address these shortcomings and to enhance functional recovery in persons that have had catastrophic injuries to the spinal cord. In particular, I will describe the translation of a therapeutic acute intermittent hypoxia protocol from detailed study of its cellular and molecular mechanisms through to its effects on limb function in both animal models and humans. Unfortunately, I do not have financial disclosure, disclosures to declare and I do not have conflicts of interest to report. However, I do have interest in building and maintaining a highly collaborative network of researchers and clinicians who are dedicated to translating promising treatment approaches that harness the molecular machinery of spinal plasticity toward effective treatments of spinal cord injury. Over the decade, more than a decade, much of the progress made in my lab could not have been made possible without strong collaborations. These collaborations involve investigators from the basic and clinical sciences, as well as the financial and intellectual support from the National Institutes of Health, Department of Defense and several private foundations. From these collaborations, I've come to realize that our research efforts should remain focused on translation to and from basic science and clinical rehabilitation. I realize the assimilation of these synergistic efforts to bolster functional recovery after injury to the spinal cord are necessary, essential, and rapidly becoming substantial. With restoring lost function as the ultimate goal in spinal cord injury rehab, there is a critical need for more targeted more precise treatments to promote plasticity and endogenous repair of residual circuits important for restoring limb use. This presentation will explore acute intermittent hypoxia as a potential treatment that challenges the traditional trajectory of spinal cord injury rehab. So I start with a very provocative fundamental question. Can we modify the air we breathe in the form of a physiological stressor to harness endogenous mechanisms of plasticity that augment motor recovery after spinal cord injury. This idea is not new. For more than 20 years, Gordon Mitchell and colleagues who started out at the University of Wisconsin, now Gordon Mitchell and many of these researchers are in, uh, at the University of Florida, who identified a complex cascade of acute intermittent hypoxia-induced plasticity and spinal motor nuclei that require, in part, among many other things, episodic serotonin release from raphe spinal projections that they send down on the motor, phrenic motor nuclei, provided that there remain some serotonergic projections that cross the injury site. We call this an incomplete injury. From there, there's initiation of new synthesis or upregulation of a brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which are called BDNF, and activation of its high affinity receptor, tyrosine kinase B. From there, there's postulated downstream signaling events, including MAP kinase activation and glutamate receptor insertion at the synapse between the premotor and motor neurons, thereby increasing synaptic strength, motor neuron activation, and leading to a functional change, as is the case of breathing, an improvement in breathing capacity. 
what these investigators found was that upregulation and new synthesis of BDNF is necessary and sufficient to elicit the long-term facilitation of respiratory drive in rodents with high cervical C2 hemisected lesions where half their diaphragmatic breathing was compromised. What they also found by chance was that the BDNF upregulation occurred outside of the phrenic motor nuclei, descending on motor areas within the spinal cord far distal to the cervical cord. As it turns out, this finding and this, this new development provided us a greater appreciation for how a new treatment in one motor or sensory system can be relevant to others, such as walking. Since the neural system controlling breathing is similar to somatic motor control in many important respects, we can think of diaphragmatic breathing involving muscles that are striated, involving alpha motor neurons, volitional and automatic control. It's not unreasonable to suggest that similar BDNF dependent mechanisms of plasticity may drive non-respiratory motor control. Indeed, since acute intermittent hypoxia restores respiratory function after C2 injuries and involves an upregulation of BDNF and motor nuclei along the entire neuraxis, my colleagues out of, the, out of Canada at the University of Saskatchewan tested the hypothesis that acute intermittent hypoxia restores limb function in rats with cervical incomplete dorsolateral funiculus lesions. In 2012, my colleagues, Jillian Muir and others, conducted a study to measure the extent to which 30 minutes of acute intermittent hypoxia affects locomotor performance on a ladder locomotor task. The figure on the left illustrates a rat negotiating a ladder with four paws slipping occurring between the rungs. And these rats performed fairly poorly during this task of horizontal ladder walking just prior to the treatment. However, however, most striking was the effect of this performance after seven consecutive days of acute intermittent hypoxia, as depicted in the treatments in the yellow arrows pointing down days one through seven. The performance on the left of a rodent negotiating the ladder on the seventh day of treatment makes minimal to zero errors in performance. As it turns out, this beneficial changes as shown in the right plot in magenta far exceeded what we would ever expect from a, a treatment such as this that persisted not only after the seven days, but near 28 days following the seven day treatment. As a follow-up, in 2015, Muir also found that this treatment, this pretreatment of intermittent hypoxia, was most potent when it was combined with the task of horizontal ladder walking. And she found that there was no effect in rodents that did not receive this training, nor did she find that when individual rodents received this training, did they improve in other untrained tasks, such as reach to grasp. So collectively, these results suggest that intermittent hypoxia as a pre, as it, as can serve as a pretreatment for task-specific motor training, and that this pretreatment is more effective at enhancing performance of the trained motor task than any other forms of tasks or motor tasks. The exciting discovery that persisted in rodent models of spinal cord injury may translate to similar benefits in humans with spinal cord injury. We asked the question, can breathing mild bouts of low oxygen prior to gait training improve walking function in persons with spinal cord injury? What we know from prior animal studies is that BDNF is important for motor facilitation. BDNF is necessary and sufficient for acute intermittent hypoxia-induced plasticity in rats. We know upregulation of BDNF through motor training and exercise is associated with functional recovery after spinal cord injury. And exogenous BDNF can also improve motor recovery after injury. So the possibility of translating a pretreatment of intermittent hypoxia with 
locomotor training and exercise could produce a greater effect than either one alone. So we focused our early studies on the safety and efficacy of a low dose acute intermittent hypoxia as a pre-treatment to gait training in persons with chronic incomplete spinal cord injury. Certainly we know that the physiological, physiological triggers of plasticity are not always good. Prolonged exposure to low oxygen, such as the case of sleep apnea, trigger maladaptive changes and serve no therapeutic purpose. Chronic hypoxia exposure can elicit hypertension, cell death, learning deficits, sleep loss, and DNA injury. But early work in rodents show less severe protocols do not elicit these maladaptive changes. Instead, these brief intermittent exposures elicit a form of pattern sensitive plasticity that has very profound functional benefit. Thus, we need to consider a balance must be achieved between maximal improvement in motor function and minimizing adverse consequences. As it turns out, there's been some great promise and progress, which has led to some exciting proof of principle studies in humans. In 2014, we conducted a first in human study to examine the safety and efficacy of daily acute intermittent hypoxia alone, as well as with training on walking ability in humans with spinal injury. This is a randomized clinical trial that took place at Emory University, the Shepherd Center in Atlanta, Georgia, and the Rehab Institute of Chicago. We used a repeated measures crossover double-blinded study design. The studies participate in five consecutive days of intermittent hypoxia or SHAM, which is intermittent room air, followed by 30 minutes of intensive overground walking practice. Our outcome measures were looking at the speed of walking and the endurance of walking using standard clinical measures of walking speed, that is the 10 meter walk test and standard measures of walking distance, which is referred, which we used as the six minute walk test. The intermittent hypoxia breathing protocol session consisted of 15 90 second episodes of breathing at between nine and 10% oxygen, which corresponded to an altitude of about 20,000 feet above sea level with 60 second room, in, room air intervals at 21%. The air delivery system supplied either low oxygen or room air to a breathing circuit that connects to a non rebreather mask worn by the participant. And we use nitrogen to counterbalance the oxygen concentrations. We also continuously monitor patient participants, cardiovascular and respiratory function throughout the breathing. And we're happy to report no serious adverse events occurred in these trials or in any of the trials that we've run in humans to date. What we did find was that participants who received daily acute intermittent hypoxia prior to their walking training greatly improved their overground walking performance. Plot on the left is a summary of the average improvements on the six minute walk test in 10 participants after day one, day five, and follows one and two weeks after the first treatment. Participants improved their six minute walk test distance by 37% after a single week. These results are quite profound since more than 70% of these individuals achieved a minimal clinically important difference in walking endurance of more than 50 meters. And many had gains of over 100 meters seen with a short treatment duration of acute intermittent hypoxia with training. This greater than 100 meters is comparable or even greater than those seen with much longer training studies. In fact, these contemporary walking studies have found that similar performance gains typically occur between four and 12 weeks in duration. Is it possible that the acute intermittent hypoxia treatment may serve as an accelerator for improvements and performance on the training? That's one thing that we should certainly consider in the future. We found also that daily acute intermittent hypoxia is far more effective as a primer to bolster the outcomes of training than as a standalone treatment. The plot on the right shows a comparison between the effects of daily acute intermittent hypoxia alone and daily acute intermittent hypoxia and walking practice on overground walking distance. The distance following the combined treatment far exceeded the distance that was obtained just from the intermittent hypoxia alone. 
Nevertheless, these beneficial effects on walking did not persist for all participants. And so we ask an important clinical impact question. Can we improve the beneficial effects of acute intermittent hypoxia alone or by adding more treatment days as done in the rodent models? To address this question, we conducted the same trial as before. Instead, we doubled the number of treatments from five to 10 days and found that the enhancement that we saw from the original five-day treatment was dramatically greater when we added five additional days. Group data are presented on the left with total distance traveled during each training day. And you can clearly see a very large increase in overall distance traveled between days one through days 10. Indeed, we found that the improvement in training distance also associated with improvements in walking speed that persisted more than one month after the last treatment. And similarly, improvements occurred for walking distance as shown on the right plot. Despite these promising discoveries in rodents and humans, the benefits of acute intermittent hypoxia may be attenuated by competing mechanisms. These mechanisms may account for 30% of participants who did not improve their walking performance after acute intermittent hypoxia. What we know is that there are numerous pathways that elicit their own form of motor facilitation However, when they are activated together, it may result in cancellation of effects. For instance, the denosine 2A receptors activated during acute intermittent hypoxia trigger a cellular cascade that competes with and undermines the serotonin-dependent pathway postulated to give rise to functional recovery. Mild hypoxia causes ATP release from glial and other sources leading to an accumulation of extracellular adenosine and subsequent activation of a G-coupled S-protein can elicit a distinct form of motor facilitation that occurs through new TREK B synthesis and downstream signaling through protein kinases. While modest acute intermittent hypoxia, the Q pathway dominates, but can be restrained by an S pathway coactivation. Consequently, an adenosine 2A antagonist, receptor antagonist, such as estradephylene, administered intraspinally or systemically in rodents, enhanced motor facilitation following AIH. Thus, we are testing this possibility in humans. Can we remove an endogenous constraint to motor plasticity with an adenosine 2A receptor antagonist in humans? We could test this poss possibility of crosstalk inhibition during acute intermittent hypoxia with a well-tolerated A2A antagonist known as caffeine and then measure the acute intermittent hypoxia-induced improvements in motor recovery in persons with chronic spinal cord injury. We did this and showed in preliminary results that indeed administering moderate doses of caffeine 30 minutes before acute intermittent hypoxia produced far greater improvement in walking speed as compared to controls, acute intermittent hypoxia alone, or caffeine alone. So in summary, Acute intermittent hypoxia alone, but more when combined with training, appears to trigger rapid mechanisms of plasticity that increase motor output in the respiratory and non-respiratory systems of rodents and humans with spinal cord injury. Indeed, these results are exciting and offer support for acute intermittent hypoxia as a potential adjuvant for broad ranges of spinal cord injury treatments. Nevertheless, the future success or failure of intermittent hypoxia will depend in part on a few critical questions. What we know is there is no silver bullet to spinal cord injury rehab. And some of these questions that are still unanswered, our colleagues, my colleagues and I are actively pursuing. For example, are there biological markers that may make people more or less responsive to this form of treatment? And are there medical conditions or other treatments that influence the safety and efficacy of acute intermittent hypoxia, such as medications, genetics, polymorphisms, inflammation, and sleep disorder breathing. And so with that, I would like to say thank you, and I'll take any questions.